Tell me, what is the best story ever told? Oh, well, well, I mean, there are lots of different- Tell me, for I must know! Do you mean in terms of, like, writing, or of scope, or- uh... I mean, objectively, what is the best of them all? Well, I can tell you my favorites. Why do you pretend your opinion is objective fact? I didn't say- You rated your favorite book higher than Foundation, a classic! How dare you! I just didn't enjoy Foundation that much. Cause you're a hack! I often get asked, what are the best stories ever? And of course, I am here to give you the objectively correct answer. Transformers Dark Side of the Moon. No, as if I could ever answer that, as if I would ever know. I mean, there are lots of classic books and films which are technically good, but I did not enjoy in the slightest. Here's looking at you to kill a mockingbird. <laughs> Or stories which are technically not that well written, but still affected me a lot. Here's looking at you, life is strange. But, someone asked me a better question recently. Which books changed your life? Tubi, it was an honor to fight with you. Truly. The honor was mine. You're dying. But you know which book will objectively change your life? On Writing and World Building, Volume 2, out now. It's a codified version of the writing and world building discussions we've had, from fight scenes to hard and uh, soft world building, with a ton of exclusive uh, content and extra detail and depth. Thank you to the thousands of you that have already bought it, and please do leave a review on Amazon. I cannot understate how once Volume 1 got a ton of reviews, it started selling itself, you know, without me saying anything, and continues to sell today. So thank you to those who have already done that. Thank you if you do. Now, I could say stories like Avatar The Last Airbender or Lord of the Rings, because, you know, without them I would not have the life I do. They literally did change my life. And I am very invested in them, but Today I want to talk about the stories that go deeper than that. Stories that have changed how you look at yourself or the world in a deeply personal way. Not necessarily the best writing or groundbreaking, but that have stayed with you all this time. Whatever they may be, and I want you to tell me yours down below. My first one is probably Paper Towns by John Green. Now, if you've watched the channel for a while, you've probably picked up that I like John Green's books. I'm not saying they're the best books ever written, but I like his writing style and the things that he writes about really resonate with me. And in particular, Paper Towns seemed targeted at me. I read Paper Towns in probably 2013. It's about a girl, Margot, who goes missing and a boy, Quentin, who wants to find her. The plot is really him trying to figure out why she upped and left and what's going through her mind and eventually he comes to believe that she is about to kill herself and he is in a race against time to track her down and save her before she does it. At the end of the book though when he finally finds her there's something off. She isn't the way he expected to find her. She turns around and explodes at him. She screams at me now pulling herself up by her shirt so she can get in my face. You didn't come here to make sure I was okay. You came here because you wanted to save poor little Margot from her troubled little self so that I would be oh so thankful to my knight in shining armor that I would strip my clothes off and beg you to ravage my body. Yikes. And I'm not saying that that particular line was targeted at me, just that Paper Towns is about how we imagine others. That unbridgeable gap between ourselves and other people that even though we might know someone really damn well, we might have been married to them for decades, there's always going to be this gap between how we imagine and understand them and the way they really are. 
And that gap is often made up of our biases, the things we want from them or how they fit into our own personal narrative, the things we want from ourselves. Quentin wanted to be that knight in shining armor for her and interpreted all of those quote clues that she left behind in that light. Paper Towns was really the first book to weaponize my own biases against me because I totally bought into how Quentin was thinking of her. I wanted that vindicating horror. And I think at the time I did a lot of what Quentin was doing, not with girls specifically, but I wasn't really aware of how much I imagined others in terms of my own personal narrative, rather than trying to imagine and understand them in their own terms. It made me think about how I am never going to understand someone perfectly, to know them like they know themselves. But it did make me take a step back and reconsider how it was imagined other people to make more of an effort to understand them in their own terms. Everybody else was doing things for the last time, but I was doing them for the first. Two, Neurotomata. This one was a complete fluke. My girlfriend made me pick it out of a warehouse bargain bin for $20 some years ago, and I didn't play it till the 2020 COVID lockdown. And I had no idea of what I was in for. <laughs> Nier Automata is about a sexy robot. It's about two androids, 2B and 9S, who are fighting to reconquer Earth for humanity after another group of mindless robots took it over. It's the thing that gives them purpose, a sense of their place in the world, a purpose to the violence they have to commit and the pain they have to endure. Except they realize that these robots they've been killing aren't mindless, that they have personalities and societies and religions that they have formed in an attempt to create meaning for themselves in this world. And then 9S finds out that humanity has been long dead, that even if they won this war, humanity would not return to Earth. Fundamentally, it asks what we do when we come to believe that the world has no inherent meaning. I think it takes a lot from Albert Camus' philosophy, looking at what we hold on to when the structures that have given us purpose, our beliefs, when they fall away or are taken from us. How do we confront the absurdity of life? And Neo Automata's answer seems to be community. That connecting with others doesn't just give us meaning and purpose, but it makes us more human. Putting aside that I played this game during the 2020 COVID lockdown when physical human connection was literally impossible, Nier Automata just did something to me. I, I can't explain it, but... Uh. Okay, listen to this. Let me explain. The end credits are this bullet hell fight becoming so difficult that you literally cannot win until you accept help from other players. But after they've saved you, the game asks if you're willing to do the same for others. And all it costs is all of your game data. The game you just completed, that you just invested all of this time into, and you have to choose whether to literally delete all of your data just to help a stranger that you have never met for the sake of human connection. I was crying so much when this happened. I mean, how is it possible that something could do that in the credits? Just unstoppably. Albert Camus once wrote, we must imagine Sisyphus happy. Sisyphus being the man condemned to push a rock up a slope forever. But if we're doing it with someone else, then it might just be bearable and we might find some meaning in it together. A lot of stories have dealt with these themes, but Nero Automata just hit them home in a way I've rarely encountered. In a particular, it's a testament to how video games are art. Hogfather by Terry Pratchett, who I do genuinely believe is one of the best writers of all time, or at least of the last half century. Building right off that Neo Automata discussion, Hogfather radically shaped how I look at how we find meaning in the world. It has, hands down, my favorite scene ever written, and I am going to read it to you. All right, said Susan, I'm not stupid. You're saying humans need fantasies to make life bearable. Really? As if it was some kind of pink pill? No. Humans need fantasy to be human. 
to be the place where the falling angel meets the rising ape. Tooth fairies, hog fathers, little yes. As practice, you have to start out learning to believe the little lies. So we can believe in the big ones? Yes. Justice, mercy, duty, that sort of thing. They're not the same at all. You think so? Then take the universe and grind it down to the finest powder and sieve it through the finest sieve and then show me one atom of justice, one molecule of mercy, and yet, death waved a hand. And yet, you act as if there is some ideal order in the world, as if there is some, some rightness in the universe by which it may be judged. Yes, but people have got to believe in that, or, or what's the point? My point exactly. It's about the Santa Claus of this fictional world, the Hogfather disappearing because people are no longer believing in him, but it's about so much more than that. The idea that we will never know whether things we believe are inherently true or not, but to keep believing in them anyway, oh, they're not knowing whether it's really true or not doesn't make it worthless, doesn't make it not worth believing in. Because so much of life is about investing things with meaning, regardless of whether or not those things have inherent meaning. And I can't explain how much Hogfather brought me to that. If you're gonna read a Terry Pratchett book, read Hogfather. Thirdly, The Testaments by Margaret Atwood. Wait, I know you don't know this book, but that's fine. I, I'll make it more interesting, like Mr. Beast. What's up, Timsters? Just like Squid Game, the Testaments are set in a dystopia, and I'm gonna be giving one lucky person who likes and subscribes to this video 10,000 nothings. That's right. You... I can't do this. You're probably more familiar with The Handmaid's Tale, but this is the sequel-ish book, and it was one of the more profound reading experiences I have had in a long time. It's based in Gilead, a patriarchal, theocratic dystopia where women are brutally repressed and the lore is a twisted version of the Old Testament. You could say it's a story about escaping Gilead or bringing it down, but it, it, it's really not that. Or at least that wasn't the story that stuck with me. It's an interrogation of faith and institutional religion and how it affects how we view ourselves and others and the world around us. About how hard it is to deconstruct beliefs we incorporate into our sense of self and what that can feel like. I don't talk a lot about my personal life on here, but I was raised in a Christian home, great parents, and I went to church for 25 years of my life. I only stopped going this year and when my parents ask why I've stopped going I don't really have a clear answer for them you know most of my friends moved on from the church yeah sure so I didn't have much keeping me there but I've had a long journey of questioning what I believe and why and I, I don't really know where I am anymore that's a whole rabbit hole but there was this one line in the Testaments that really stuck with me and I want to read it to you. I feared I might lose my faith. If you've never had a faith, you will not understand what that means. You feel as if your best friend is dying, that everything that defined you is being burned away, that you'll be left all alone. You feel exiled and as if you are lost in a dark wood. It was like the feeling I'd had when Tabitha died. The world was emptying itself of meaning. Everything was hollow. Everything was withering. Reading this book with what I've been going through has been hard, but it made me feel understood in a weird way. There's this character in the novel who is trying to rationalize before letting go, this slow, grueling process of trying to figure out who they are without it, of what to hold on to and what to leave behind. It was pretty confronting because when people ask me, what do you believe now? I don't know, and it's like I know myself less and less. 
The Testaments has a disillusionment arc, but Atwood also has this intense sympathy of the struggle to let go. Empathy for how faith can be an important part of you, at the same time as understanding that it can be weaponized against you, even without you realizing. Goodness, I hope my parents don't watch this video. Let's talk about something uh, happier. What remains of Edith Finch, the very happy, not at all depressing game with nothing sad about it at all whatsoever. I've talked about this game before because it is amazing. But I started playing it back in 2017, right as I started working at the suicide and self-harm hotline, and I don't think that's a coincidence. It's about someone returning to their family home. A house built on a foundation of tragedy and built out of walls of memory. And recounting how each of their family members, going back generations, died. Few stories have managed to ground me in their emotional reality quite like what remains of Edith Finch. A reality just full of complicated, flawed humans who don't want to hurt each other, but do and can't stop doing it. Bear Town by Frederick Bachman had a similar impact on me. But What Remains of Edith Finch left such a mark on me because of how it features one of the most harrowing depictions I have ever seen of suicide. Without ever relying on showing us the gruesome scars, or the rope, or the trying itself, or blood, we don't even see the character really shed a tear. I've always had a soft spot for stories that tackle abuse, and suicide, and self-harm, and few of them have dealt with it with the empathy and tact that this game does. It manages to place you in that headspace with such authenticity and kindness that I cannot help but keep returning to it. It'd be wrong for me to say that Edith Finch or Life is Strange motivated me to join the hotline that I work for now. It just wasn't that. Because I've had a long, complicated history with those things that led to that. But these games did make me feel understood and helped me understand others more. They helped me process my feelings in a healthy way. You know sometimes a story will be part of you dealing with something, even if you can't pin down exactly how, but you know that they were a part of it. That's what Edith Finch and Life is Strange were for me. A part of a long journey towards healing that coincided with me joining the hotline. Also, I am not saying that Life is Strange is a masterpiece. It is not. Edith Finch is. But these stories just hit the right person at the right time in the right emotional space. Me, circa 2015 to 2017. <laughs> if we lived forever, maybe we'd have time to understand things. But as it is, I think the best we can do is try to open our eyes and appreciate how strange and brief all of this is. Children of Time by Adrian Tchaikovsky, not only one of the best books I have ever read, but the only book that I own the paperback, audiobook, and ebook of. <laughs> Humanity has spread out into the stars with evolutionary science. We seed planets with apes and a virus that will accelerate their evolution while we watch from the skies. Except, it goes wrong. The virus doesn't infect the apes. It infects spiders. Children of Time follows the ascent of the spider civilization over thousands of years, and it genuinely made me like spiders more. But it's a bit hard for me to put down exactly what impact it left on me. It's a book about empathy, about the power of empathy, and about the power of connection with another creature and seeing ourselves in them and what it means to do that. Another book, Speak for the Dead, did a similar story. But um, I think this did it better in some ways because it so readily invites the oh, participate in that in the. I love it. The Talos Principle, and for literally my favorite game ever made, I have nothing to show for it, which sucks. Actually, I have a cat. One second. If you know, you know. The weird thing about the Tales Principle is that you can basically go through the entire game without ever encountering the story. Uh, but don't do that, because few stories have ever left such an impact on me. I must have played it back in 2014 or so. It's a puzzle game, one of the best ever created in terms of design and difficulty scaling, where an android wakes up in ancient Greek ruins with a booming voice from the heavens telling him, 
You may go into everything I have created for you, but you must not go to the tower. The big metal structure in the middle of the map. Fundamentally, Talos is about an android becoming human in the most meaningful way. It breaks down all of the conceptions we have of what human means, and it forces us to ask what being a person really means. You know, is it flesh and blood? Is it free will? Is it the ability to reason? Tons of stories have done this theme, but Talos was my first real exposure to it and it did it more elegantly than almost any other story I've seen. I mean, Blade Runner 2049 is my favorite film for this exact reason. What does it mean to be authentically human? If our memories are fake or misremembered, does that make the emotions that we attach to them or how we act on them less authentic, less real? These stories have changed how I look at myself, my understanding of what it means to make a free choice, of which parts of me were programmed or decided by my environment or parents, and which parts of me I genuinely chose for myself. That's been something that I've wrestled with for a while, and you know, the more I think about it, the more I realize that, that there's something that sort of connects all of these stories in a way, you know what I mean? Again, just like Children of Time, it is empathy, understand someone else in a more fundamental level. Speak of the Dead by Orson Scott Card. A group of scientists are living amongst the dominant species of a planet, the Pequeninos, when one of the scientists is murdered. The one that they thought the Pequeninos trusted the most. Both Ender's Game and Speak of the Dead speak to a really powerful theme of empathy. <clears throat> For the first time in my life, I've tried to force myself to put down in words why these stories have stuck with me. And as I wrote the script, I realized that a couple of themes came through. Two things that connected basically all of the books. The first one was empathy in the case of Speaker for the Dead and Blade Runner and Children of Time. These books ask me to empathize with something that is far different to myself. You know, in, in Children of Time, he, he paints the spiders, perhaps the most reviled creature on the planet, as something you should love and root for, and he succeeded. In Speak for the Dead, it's creatures that murdered a scientist that are so different to us in their culture. Even Paper Towns is about my imperfect empathy, looking at how I empathize with others. You might have picked up on a theme with Nier Automata and Talos and Blade Runner that I like the theme of the line between humanity and artificial intelligence, what it means to be human. But again, isn't that about empathy in a way? You know, it's about looking at the things that fundamentally connect us rather than separate us, breaking down those barriers that we think exist between us and other people. The truth is, across my teen years and as I grew into adulthood, some people have told me that I'm not the most empathetic person all the time. I'm not a psychopath, I promise, but uh, I'm flawed, like everyone is. And there are times in my life where I should have been more empathetic, or could have been. And these stories have really played into that emotional journey as I've grown and matured. They've been a part of it. A part of me growing and changing. They force me to set aside the superficial things that separate us and look at what fundamentally connects us. To look more deeply at understanding those around me. Empathizing with replicants and androids and aliens and robots, yes, but, but with people, right? With people. The second thing that really came through in, you know, stories like Nier Automata and Hogfather and the Testaments was that search for meaning. Was confronting the idea that the things I've always believed may not be true and what to do with those feelings, what to do with those beliefs. Are they worth holding on to? Are they worth leaving behind? How do we find meaning in this world when we don't know it's there? And it's only stepping back after all these years that I see what connects those stories. I don't know what all of this says about me, 
But all these stories have challenged me in some way. And they're going to stay in my heart for a long time. I want to finish this off with some honourable mentions. First off, Bridge to Terabithia by Lois Lowry, which I read in 2006 when I might have been like 11 or 10, and was probably the first book to hit me thematically and emotionally in a way I had never been hit before. You could say that I just fell into this story and it dashed me against the rocks of emotion. <laughs> Two, History Boys by Alan Bennett, which is actually a play. So it really changed how I look at education, something that isn't just there to help us get a job and survive, but is something that is valuable in and of itself, something that we can enrich our lives with. It was part of my journey, if I'm gonna be honest, towards becoming an advocate for free and open and accessible education, which is what I'm trying to do now, and hopefully succeeding. <laughs> Lastly, House of Leaves by Mark Z. Danielewski. One of the strangest books ever written, and one of the only books in the world that if you ask people what it's really about, you're gonna get entirely different answers, even just down to the level of the damn plot. It stuck with me as a real testament to just what a book can be when stretched to its limits. It didn't make it because I don't know how it's changed me, but I certainly haven't been able to stop thinking about it, what it does with its characters and how it does it. Same with Annihilation by Jeff Vandermeer, though this does fit into that deconstruction trope that I've been talking about, deconstructing who we are and what we believe and what makes us us and which parts of us are chosen for us and which parts of us are genuinely who we are and have chosen for ourselves. But I want to know which stories have changed your life, which stories have stuck with you all this time, how and why, where were you psychologically that made it stick? Tell me down below. It has been an interesting year come to its end, as judged by the festivities behind me. But um, it's been a good one, I guess. You know, lots of ups and downs, but I actually achieved my two main goals. Number one, I sent off my fiction book to agents, which I've been working towards for a long time. I went through the beta reading phase and everything. And two, I started writing short stories, which I've sort of been sharing with you a little bit across this year. And... I have just been accepted for publication in a magazine. I can't give you more details than that, but it's coming next year. That's all from me. For this year, for 2021. Good luck guys. Stay safe. Stay nerdy from Supreme Leader Momo, and we will see you in the future. <laughs>